Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Uh, we have a very special guest today, uh, someone that I uh, saw a couple of weeks, maybe a little over a month ago. Uh, and for this one, uh, because he wanted to do a show about someone involved with Kent Hovind, we've got our dear friend, Professor Flynn, who's joining us. And uh, so, hey Flynn, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing fine, as always. Um, yeah, as I said, we've got an amazing guest. So I, I just want to hop in because I'm I'm really anxious to to, to talk to him. Uh, our guest yeah. today is McKinnon Mitchell. McKinnon, welcome to the show. Oh, well, hi. <laughs> Don't look so surprised. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? And doing fine. So um, you made this amazing documentary about our our friend Kent Hovind. Uh, so what you may not know, but the reason that I'm here and that all of you are here right now is because of Kent Hovind. In I think it was 2014 when, for some stupid reason, uh, YouTube. Uh, in in my my recommendations, had a video of Kent Hovind called "100 Reasons Why Evolution Is Stupid," and I watched that and I thought, if this is something that people actually believe, I need to do something. So that's when I started my Twitter account, started uh, talking to creationists on Twitter, eventually got to a YouTube channel. So yeah, Kent Hovind is literally the reason I'm here, but. I'm really curious, how did you get to, to Kent Hovind? Mm. Uh, for a while there, I was really uh, into watching debates, I've kind of been disillusioned by it in recent years. Uh, but uh, one of them was Kent and uh, the guy just seemed ridiculous. But then I saw him <laughs> being in other debates and others. And then I eventually saw that he was with, uh, in a discussion with Aaron Ra. Uh, and there was a few things mentioned uh, from there. I saw RMO's content about him being an inmate. And then I just I had to research, you know, and so I started looking it up uh, and I've realized that I found out the 45 felony counts, you know, that he has. And once you start there, it's just this rabbit hole that you just go down. And you're like, oh, he has 45 felony. Count. What the hell? And then you start looking more like yeah. he had a dinosaur van literature theme park and then you just go you find out all the other things he's done and it's just it goes it, you know it gets very layered you know you just find out more and more and then you find out really horrible stuff you know but that was really just kind of how the exploration of kent hoven started okay and yeah you you did uh, an incredibly in-depth uh documentary where um i've been following uh hoven for as as from the moment I, I discovered him and tried to figure out what he was about and, and trying to find out more than just the debates that you see. Uh, uh, I, I pretty much saw all of the debates. I saw the, the CSE extra classes that he had. And, and like you, I discovered he had a dinosaur adventure land. Then I found out that he was in prison at that time. So I, I looked into that. Um, it, but I learned so much from your documentary, things that I had never heard about. I mean, I saw pictures of Kent Hovind that I've never seen anywhere online. How do you get started it's true. and, and, um, where do you start your work and, and how, how does that develop? And can, can I just say, Peter, I just want to tack on to that. One of the most striking images of Kent Hovind, um, because it's perfectly apropos, is Kent Hovind, a still picture of him wearing a wife beater. Yeah. <laughs> right? With his big gut. And I have never, I've been through all the Hovind stuff. I've never seen that. And how appropriate is it that Kent Hovind, as we'll talk about, I'm sure, is wearing a wife beater? So, yeah, how do you get those? those images is amazing. So it's just, it's a lot of legwork. Um, you know, so, I mean, the, the thing that I do that makes it really effective is essentially you, you do a data dump. Um, uh, I look up for just, you know, through Google or other search engines, 
um, and even social media platforms, you just zero in on keywords. Now I'm in marketing, so I know how a lot of these algorithms and these search engines work. Um, so I know how to use, whether it's just the first links that you see in the Google search, you can even use images to find, you know, a lot of different links that you may not have found otherwise, because that certain image is, you know, it has certain tags and keywords that are put in the meta description. Uh, and same thing, you know, with SEO. So I, I was able to go through and just grab as much as, as many links as I could. And I would put them in, you know, docs, uh, and, and documents, you know, and from there, it's the heavy ass legwork of just going down every single one of those links, wow. reading them from start to finish and finding the information that is relevant, that is useful. Um, and that then you also take that information and you try to correlate it and create a timeline, um, you know, and really want to make sure that you can have a full story. And then from there, my interest wasn't really in telling the story in just a linear fashion is more about phases of Kent's life partnered with, um, you know, kind of themes of the, what we call weaknesses of Kent, um, with his flaws of his character and how those timelines kind of have key moments reflecting that, you know, and still trying to be as, as linear as you can, otherwise you can get really jumbled up. Uh, but that's, that's the whole process. So, you know, there are a lot of different ways that <clears throat> we could, speaking of, you know, whether to obey a chronology or not, there are lots of different ways we could structure this discussion. And one of the ways that I will, I've now watched that documentary twice, twice, <clears throat> once again this afternoon. Well, thank you. And maybe one way for us to proceed, Peter, I don't know if, if you're okay with this because I haven't asked you, but maybe you, sh you could very briefly outline what, I don't know, three or five or you know some small number of his weaknesses are and then maybe we can proceed with discussing them sort of one at a time does that seem like a good way to proceed um yeah sure uh that's fine with me um so just, what's you know, top three top three weaknesses top three weaknesses um <laughs> I, know, I know there's a lot to choose from. yes i mean <laughs> And, and a lot of them, it was really try. It was really hard to like try to define, you know, one of them. But I mean, I guess for me, I guess it's his spineless. Spineless might be one of the top three because I mean, it it, it touches. It, it's pretty all encompassing to a lot of his other flaws. So, yeah. in what ways does that spinelessness express itself? Um, well, <laughs> one of the biggest uh, moments in the documentary uh, was. Kent during or at the end of the trial, he or throughout the trial, he kept saying like, I don't, who's charging me and what are they charging me for? Mm. Um, it just kept trying to, you know, feign ignorance throughout everything, which he still does. Um, and it doesn't have to be just about his tax to tax case. Um, you know, the, but he, that, that idea that he's just going to act stupid, act dumb. Um, and then act like he doesn't know what he's talking about. When the judge asked him, do you write and speak English? you know oh yeah and his answer to that was to some degree and i'm like you absolute chicken shit coward yeah. like i you could not be more of a worm you know i mean if, if you're caught have the damn spine to you know and be able to admit it you know yeah peter you want to get in yeah that was one of the things that that amazed me that uh, yeah. even during the trial, that he pretended not to hear what people were, were telling him, this is what, what we found, and this is why that is against the law. And he just brushed everything off, and to this day pretends, uh, and I wasn't structuring, I was only taking out um, right. below this amount. That is structuring. I don't I don't care how you call that that is structuring and if you do that, that is... over a longer period of time that means there's intent that you do not want to go over that particular limit and if they had to they did it in several uh uh um times where they withdrew money well, in order to get M M McKinnon yeah and, McKinnon oh. actually deep breaks this down where they're Kent has to pay, I don't know, like 28,000 something. 30,000. Uh, yeah, 30,000. 30, 30, right. And he takes out three, what was it? 30,000. It was 
Yeah, thirty right. thousand, and it was three. So he does three of, withdrawals yeah. of the nine thousand, and then the. I mean, it's obvious because he's doing them consecutively and roughly concurrently, right? Yeah. So it's obvious what he's doing. And we should say something. I, I and Peter, I meant to say this right from the beginning so that people know. This documentary is not about and. McKinnon, you take uh, great pains to say this at the very beginning of the documentary. The documentary is not about what Ken Hoven believes, at least in a religious sense. And you say that uh, the point of your documentary is neither to support evolutionary theory nor to debunk creationist theory. So I think it's important that people know that um, the documentary really is a laundry list of, on one level, this the crimes of Kent Hovind, but it builds the case for what I thought McKinnon you would say is like his number one weakness, which is his narcissism, which fuels everything that he does. So, can you talk a bit about his narcissism, McKinnon? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the reason like the narcissism is like not at the top for me because even though it's so plain, you know that that's yeah. like embodies everything that he is. Um, it, his narcissism, I, I don't know if it's Kent or if it's in, is in his environment. What I understand about narcissism is that, from, again, from the research, not a psychologist, I have no idea. I could be entirely wrong about what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. But the consensus that, I, that I'm aware of anyway is that they don't believe you're born a narcissist. You might be born to have like, mm -hmm. you know, some, certain chemical imbalances. It's really easy to make you angrier than most people. But narcissism, I don't know if that's something you're born with. And if it's something that he was raised in, if it's something that his father did to him or the pastors did to him, or it's just something along those lines, and it helps, you know, fuel that or, you know, shape him into what he is today, you know, it, I think that's more of a weakness of IFB. And so I didn't, really, I didn't ever really want to say that was, you know, the weakness of him, you know. I, I don't know if that would entirely be fair. And I've tried actually – pretty hard to be fair to Kent throughout this yeah. entire process. Um, even mentioning with like things where, you know, if I don't have a very, a, val a valid, you know, way to verify something that happened, I'll put, you know, preface it like in fairness to Kent, I can't say that this happened for certain, you know, um, but his, his narcissism, like now that he has that, however it got to be that way, it's all about him. Like there's a clip where he's talking on a mound or something over the at dinosaur adventure land. The thing that was important to Kent was whenever he's talking about someone praying to God to ask forgiveness, he said, he starts it with like, God, Kent's right. He didn't get, he doesn't mm. care about, he has to include himself in that, that they have realized he's right. That, you know, he is this better you know person. Um, and it's the way he speaks to people. Uh, and his whole ministry and everything he does with, you know, uh, his YouTube channel and the videos, it's all about making himself feel superior, uh, superior, feel better, you know, because he taught the way he talks to people um, and the way that the, the enjoyment he has in mocking people. You don't have that, you know, without being a narcissist or, or at a bare minimum, highly egotistical to the point of it being a yeah. massive flaw. Yeah. Right. And, and we were discussing this, McKinnon, just before we we went live that I suggested that um, although Kent, I think once in his past was a soul winner. Right. He describes that in his biography, his autobiography of, you know, he was saved at 15 or 16 at this. I vaguely recall as being like a circus setting kind of thing. Um, but he went from winning souls to his ministry and his evangelism, his proselytizing involves what I call spreading the gospel of Kent Hovind, which isn't quite Christian apologetics and isn't about soul winning. It's only about the, the script that he has written slash is imitating, which I know you'll talk about in a bit, McKinnon, but it's really about spreading Kent Hovind, right? And so when he creates these videos, these YouTube videos, and once upon a time they were VHS and I think DVDs, um, it isn't about spreading the gospel. It's about spreading his script out to other people so that they, they can repeat him as he hath repeated others, right? And example number one of this, of course, is Eric who 
I don't know if he's still doing it. I haven't checked him out in a while, but Eric was being trained to do the same script and did it for quite a long time. And that's what Ken is about. It's about making people's evangelism or weak apologetics. It's about making them in Kent's image, which is profoundly narcissistic. So I think you're bang on about that. And, and he succeeded with that because, um, when Kent was in jail, uh, um, his his son took over more or less and did some some talks, and literally had the exact same scripts to the point where he told the, the exact same jokes. So at least that was drilled into him uh, to to a fair degree, I think. Um, and and yet the the as you say the the the, the narcissism. What what I found, and I don't know if you've seen uh, some of that, uh, McKinnon. I watched uh, recently. I started looking for people who have made their own home movies when they went to Dinosaur Adventureland, especially after uh, people came out and and told uh, went on video telling that it wasn't all uh, that nice being there. What I found is. The difference when he he doesn't know that he's on camera versus when he's on camera. What did you see that as well? Absolutely. Um, I struggled to include as much as possible because I, I make no effort to say that everything that's in the documentary is all there is. There's so much. If I was to do all of it, I'd be doing this forever. Um, and this is a horrible project. I hated every second of it, just to be honest. I got to um, say, that does not show in the finished product. The finished product is a work of love. Oh, thank it you is. very much. It's slick. It's amazing. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, but yes, I did see, because there are uh, plenty of videos, and one worker even, um, of Kent's, that whenever he doesn't know that he's being recorded, uh, or they can catch him acting that way just before he realizes it, um, he's horrible on how he talks to people and i wanted to include mm -hmm. that but again i'm like ah, do i put this because if i put this then i got to put this seven other things and you know but there there are videos out there um and now i think it's just in everybody else's hand to you know show that and you know they they can they can take it from here but there is yes i've absolutely seen that the moment that the camera's on it's all about trying to create this long lasting you know image of what he wants people to see the public view you know, but beneath it, he is a seething, angry, completely vain individual. And I think that's, he always, uh, he, he talks a lot about how, you know, he, he doesn't believe in the good works, getting you into heaven uh, mentality. Um, yet he is always boasting, oh, I've baptized 200 X amount of people. Mm. I've done uh, 200 something X amount of debates. Um, and he always wants to like, you know, put that out there that, oh, you know, I've done this, I've done this, look at me, I did this. And it's really, I don't, if he believes in God, we can talk about that, I don't know. But if he if he does or doesn't, it really comes across that he's either trying to show God that, oh, I'm so good, look at me. But more than likely, he's just trying to show everybody else, I'm better than you. I did all this. I did this many things. What are you doing with your life? Which someone texted me and asked, that, or, or, one, someone texted me and said that Kent, responded about the documentary and asked me like you know what are you doing with your life you know what is that is this your is your goal with your life <laughs> exactly i didn't watch it because i at this point i will never watch another kent hoven video for the rest of my life oh uh, you're a wiser man than i <laughs> yes you're, you're smarter than all of us i think because <laughs> I'm, I'm still subscribed to his channel i i literally have him on speed dial uh on my phone because uh mm -hmm. i i wanted to set uh, a few conversations up between him and other people. But after we had Robert Beatty on the channel, for some reason, my calls, uh, he, he doesn't answer. Because you've, you've got to press the number and then uh, uh, say your name. And I'm not sure if, if his memory is that good. But after we had Robert Beatty on, uh, he he answered one call because um before we had him on i talked to to Beatty and Beatty said i want to talk to to hoven directly 
And I think that if you're going to uh, do a show about someone, at least you should have the courtesy to have them uh, give their side of the story. So I did call Kent before we did that show, and I said, okay, here's the thing. I'm going to have Robert Beatty on. He's prob he's obviously going to talk about you. Um, but I want to give you the opportunity uh, to, to be there and to counter what he is saying. And that is something that I already knew that he didn't want to do. But um, he said, well, let him make a list of things. And then after you had him on, you call me back and then uh, we'll set it up and you have me on your show and we go over this list of accusations and I will address all of them one by one. So that's what we did. And I did call him back after the show and I said, okay, we, we've got a list. We did as, as you asked. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. And this is weird because it was his idea. And wh why would you, why would you even propose that if you know that you're not going to go through with it? And as I said, I wanted to be honest. I wanted to give him at least the opportunity to defend himself. Because if you're going to do that and you're not going to give him that opportunity, uh, I, th I think you're lacking. And But y didn't you contact him as well for your documentary to have uh, have him say his side of the story? Or, or did I get that wrong? I absolutely did. Um, I contacted him originally two years ago. Um, and I, as I mentioned the documentary, I contacted Kent Hoven, Brady Byram, Ernie Land, Cindy Lincoln, um, I tried to get in touch, um, with Steve Lynn, uh, and I tried to get in touch with all these individuals and I, the, the parameters of were as follows, like, I'm going to ask you questions and I'm not even going to challenge you. You're going to say your side and then we're going to move on to the next question. I'm not even going to sit here and try to like put you in a corner, uh, or anything of that nature. All I'm doing is what's wanting that side of the story in the interest of fairness. Um, and according to Cindy Lincoln, that freaked them out. Uh, and then they started to believe that I was working with Robert Beatty, which I was not, um, or that I was hired by Robert Beatty, which I was not. Um, I mean, he, he didn't have anything to do with this documentary, you know? So the, the act the, the, the fact that they freaked out to the extent, and then for the next two years, I would just every once in a while call him. I had to get a text now number on my phone because you can change it into phone number because they kept blocking my number, you know? And I, anytime I called him or called Kent, um, I would tell him. I'm like, hey, I just trying to get your side of the story. Again, you're not even going to be challenged. Um, and he would come up with a different excuse every single time. And he did the same excuse to you um, that he did to me because I, I watched one of your videos where you were asking him. He's talking about how his lawyer, like, oh, I don't know if uh, you know he can do this. Or I want to talk to my lawyer about this. Um, and specifically in regards to Cindy Lincoln, he had just like two nights ago or two days ago at that time, um, went into great detail about everything with Cindy Lincoln. And so whenever he said, mm -hmm. oh, well, I don't know if I can talk about that. Let me ask my lawyer. I, I called him. I was like, but you just talked about this pretty in depth about Cindy mm -hmm. Lincoln and pretty much anything I'm going to ask you, you answered there. Um, so, I mean, unless you just want me to take that audio, I would like to interview you for it. But that, that doesn't track that you suddenly can't talk about it when you just did. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, just let me talk to my lawyer. And he hung up. You know, and so it was a different excuse every time. Oh, I can't get reception. Oh, I'm sleepy. Sorry. Hmm. Um, any excuse he could, you know, uh, just to never talk about it. Um, not to play armchair psychologist, but I will anyhow. Um, do you think that is a conscious or subconscious maybe um, admission of guilt in a way that um, he he's okay answering some questions in very tightly controlled um, areas and in uh, tightly controlled settings. His whack and atheist thing, of course, is tight. Most of what he does is tightly controlled. And maybe because of that, offering him uh, the opportunity, ironically, offering him the opportunity to go on unrebutted, maybe he somehow knows that that is a bad situation for him. Do you think that, or how? How could you? 
because it makes no sense, right? Well, we've said none of that makes any sense. Why would he decline? What do you think it is? According to Cindy Lincoln, uh, whenever I was speaking to her, that that time when that happened, the fact that I told them, because I was very blunt when I talked to them. It's not like I said, oh, I'm just making a documentary. And I, did, I, did, I didn't try to hide the fact that it was not in his favor. I very much told him, mm-hmm. you know, this documentary is not in his favor, which the first time I talked to him, you know, I mentioned I'm an atheist. This documentary is not in your favor, but I want you to hear your, to, to you to tell your side. He's like, and you're an atheist? Well, that's really odd that you would do that. And I was, I was like, just ignore it. Just focus on what the mission to get an interview with Kent. Don't address it. Um, but he, the according to Cindy Lincoln, it, it was a, it was a, a red flag to him that I was that confident that I was going with the documentary that I didn't even care that he can tell his whole side. And so the fact that I was not trying to, you know, do anything, I'm like, you can do it. Sure, tell your whole side. Um, and the fact that I did that kind of freaked him out. Um, and I got into a text thread because I was able to get a lot of people to message Kent um, and start kind of hounding him, you know, about the documentary on his channel. Um, and he, his, his attorney, after I really got Kent flustered the last time he and I talked, he got his attorney on the phone. His attorney said, I'm on call all day. Just call me and we'll discuss how we're going to do the interview. Called the attorney six or seven times, not one time did he answer. Told Kent that nothing went through, got into a text thread with Kent, the attorney, and Ernie Land. I'm not going to disclose all of the details in there because I gave Kent my word I wouldn't, and that still stands. Mm -hmm. But the part that I can uh, talk about is that he essentially tried to take control of how this interview was going to be done, um, to which I explained to him, no, this is my interview. This is my documentary. If you want the chance to, uh, to tell your side, as I would prefer, you're going to do it in my way because he wanted slides. He wanted, he kept saying like one topic at a time, no interrupting. I'm like, this isn't a debate, Kent, where we're, I'm going to ask a question. You're going to speak and then we're going to do the next question. Um, so he was very much not listening. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he wanted to have slides. He wanted to have all these people with him in the room, which he does a lot in his videos where he tries to get support. Like if someone says, you know, on the comments, like Kent's a horrible person. Like, I'm not a horrible person, am I? I'm a good guy, aren't I? I'm the best person I know. And someone says, agrees with him. I'm like, oh, see, exactly. I'm a great guy. Like, I'm not having that shit in my interview. You know, that's just not happening. Um, and I said, if you have information or graphics in the slides that you want shown in a documentary, send them to me and I will edit them into it while you're talking about it. Because this is an interview. I mean, they are Zoom interviews. I couldn't go into them in person because, um, COVID. I'm not chancing it, but whatever. Uh, but still, I tried to make him look as professional as possible. I'm not having some dude with a damn computer beside his head, you know, in my documentary. So I'm like, I told him, like, you can have the graphics, just send them to me and I'll, over, I'll edit it over. And he's like, well, if I can't have slides, I'm not doing it. Hmm. Whatever excuse you got to tell yourself, man, to get out of this, yeah. that's fine. That uh, that puts me in mind of something that a, f- a personal friend of Leonard Cohen's once said about Leonard Cohen. He said, Leonard Cohen is a narcissist who hates himself. <laughs> I think I think that's Ken Hoven in a way, right? Because he certainly is a narcissist. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And you make the case for it and you make the case for how his narcissism and his misogyny are things that were instilled in him and or that fueled him from way back when he did his first unaccredited you college coursework. Um, but so he's a narcissist, but he hates himself in the sense that he, uh, or maybe he's just smart enough to know that there are things about himself that he knows are bad, that he doesn't want to risk revealing. And you mentioned Cindy Lincoln, who is the third of his Wives, yes, third. Yeah, um, it's there's audio from uh, an act of domestic violence between them, right? It's him and Cindy in that clip. Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, that I, I, you know, it's it's hard to listen to. Um, so you know, trigger warnings and all of that, but it's only and it probably only lasts for twenty seconds, twenty thirty seconds, if that. Um, hearing Kent not, and you can hear him speaking. First you hear him speaking angrily. Then you hear what sounds like physical violence. 
Then you hear her speaking in what I would characterize as a voice filled with fear. And then Hoven suddenly, kind of like you said earlier, McKinnon, Hoven, I think at some point realizes that someone might hear this and he switches to the to what I think is probably typical of against uh, typical of domestic violence <clears throat> perpetrators. He tries to frame what's going on as though it's her fault somehow. Oh, what are you doing, Cindy? I'm, this is my house. It, it's it's says. also it's it's also something that a narcissist will do, and it's it's a f a form of physical abuse. You stay mm -hmm. really really calm. It is it is gaslighting your victim during the act. You stay calm. There's Perfect. nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. And the moment you know a person like that, um, that becomes blatantly obvious that that is the the threatening part. And I I think uh, I think you had that in your documentary the the part where uh, he beat Eric when when he was going to the dentist. I think. Uh, wasn't that yeah can you remind that, it, remind us of that story that that's a similar thing he he goes in length explaining how he went to the dentist and eric was afraid and he said that at some point uh i took him out to the van and i set him down and I said listen son you're going to go in there and you're going to uh, first he gave him a spanking and then he said now you're going to go in there and if you don't do as, uh, and if you don't sit still, then you're going to get two of these spankings. And if that doesn't work, you get three. And he does that in a very calm voice. And he said he did that in a very calm voice. That is his way of threatening people. That is when he becomes dangerous, when he's really calm, when he's not as upbeat as he is in his videos, and when he's talking to people. I think that is a sure sign. But what what what's your take on this mckinnon yeah i mean he seems to to have that you know mentality that if he's if he is acting in a certain way you can't then say that he's acting he he is trying to not present the typical you know view of abuse you know um that you know, you associate when someone's angry or someone's offended or someone is about to be uh, violent he doesn't want that because then he couldn't possibly say there's no there's nowhere there's nowhere to retreat to. But if he says I was entirely calm the whole time, I was just trying to get her to stop, you know, there's a there's a there's a shield in that, you know, um, and he uses that quite often. Yeah, and and so I I spoke with uh, with Cindy as well uh, a couple of times now. Um, there were a lot of people who said, well. Uh, the audio isn't conclusive because uh, it could have been that she was was the aggressor. I don't get that idea when I'm talking to Cindy. I I get the idea, and also her story doesn't change. It's always the same. If someone is lying, they will screw up at some point, and will will details will differ. Um, I I really think that she was afraid. And and probably still is at some point, uh, because it's it's still ongoing, which is another telling thing. Uh, that they're, they're still well ruining her property. It, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's amazing that this, well, this that it lasted so long. I mean that yeah. this these things haven't come out earlier. That's the part that I don't get. Mm. And we're, re we're revealing here, I should say, by the way, Peter, and everything that you've said and much of what we said thus far. And uh, I think you're right. Uh, I'm understanding it more and more beginning when you said that his his sort of uh, cowardice is his his defining weakness. Um, man, that cowardice fuels his dishonesty. He is an abject liar. And you really lay out, and he he lies about the silliest things, like about the SWAT team that came and, and came and arrested him, which didn't happen at all. Yeah. Um, he's just an inveterate liar. And would you say McKinnon? I mean, I think if our, he's on, is he on wife number four now, or are they Dunzo as well? I can't remember. Uh, he is still with wife number four. She does seem to be. 
um, agreeable to the just That's, stay blind, stay deaf, stay mute uh, kind of wife. Um, and if I'm not sitting here trying to say that, you know, there's, I think if you have it for the right reasons, then sure. But I mean, unless if she's there and she's not being abused and she's genuinely happy living like that, good for yeah. her. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to tell everybody how they should have relationships as long as there's not abuse. Um, I mean, there's some women out there that just, that's what they yeah, embody and that's thing. what they like. So if that's the perfect match for Kent, okay. Um, but yes, he is on wife number four. And so far, doesn't seem to be any issues that we've know, that we're aware of. It. What do you think? Because anyone, you know, from Kent Hovind to Larry King, anyone who has consecutive wives at the rate that he has, um, you know, he had his first wife for decades. Had I shouldn't say had he was married to uh, Joe for yes, decades, yeah. and but then in rapid succession, three wives. Uh, once he got out of prison. And is that fulfilling a need in him? Do you think, again, to be an armchair psychologist, <laughs> do you think those rapid fire marriages, I didn't say shotgun, you'll notice, because um, I don't want to picture Kent impregnating anyone. Um, what need do you think Kent might be trying to fill in himself beyond things related to his ambition? right to getting the land from one wife money from the other wife etc what what's going on there do you think why the rapid fire kent and from again if we're going to play armchair uh psychologist it seems that kent is trying to be something that he isn't um mm -hmm. tom alone and henry morris both had wives uh unless i'm completely mistaken that they ever divorced but i'm pretty sure they both had wives they never divorced these are the two people mm -hmm. who heavily influenced Kent um, and people he is trying to emulate. Uh, the Bible, as he repeatedly says, um, that you know it's not good that they be alone, that they have to have a wife and they have to be submissive um, and be sub you know, so submissive to the husband. And he is trying to have that. And just like with the calm demeanor, just like with having a fake doctorate, he wants to, he's trying to be something that he isn't mm -hmm. and he never will be. And it kind of actually touches on what you were saying before um about you know uh, kent is that he, he's even like with the boot camp thing that he does he's always talking about a war he's always talking about be a soldier mm. do this do that and he's never enlisted um and in fact currently uh because i'm not the, my wife but like i enlisted in the army i have never been divorced i have a wife i have four children uh we have a happy relationship um i am an extremely successful, successful individual in marketing um everything that he is essentially trying to do it's not him. And he's trying so yeah. hard to the moment that someone puts that mirror up there and says, Hey, you're not exactly what you think you are. He becomes irritated. He becomes violent. He becomes uh, very, you know, insult, he insults people and very offensive. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it makes him have to take a second and he has to either acknowledge that, Hey, I'm not all that. Um, I have some work to do on myself or he has to silence what's happening. Yeah. Um, and the wife thing, I think it's just the idea that a preacher has a wife, a man has a wife, um, that is a woman's role in his mind. Uh, yeah. they're an object that he just has to acquire, you know, that he has to have, you know, for a, a laundry list of reasons. And he's just trying to be this thing that he never will. Well, there's that moment, uh, that you cover in the documentary where he says that, um, and gosh, I won't do as good a Kent Hovind impersonation as Atheist Jr. does, but he says, Shara, Shara is the only wife uh, in, the, in the New Testament who's, uh, who's recognized for her performing her wifely duties in the New Testament, because in the Old Testament, he, uh, she calls her, her husband, my Lord. Um, and so that really is, you know, one of the bases of his, you know, he... You know, we have a cosmic microwave background. He has, he has a misogynistic microwave background that informs so much of what he does. It's really, it's really offensive. And um, it is, you can infer that from watching all of his videos, certainly. But I haven't seen anyone lay out the case for his misogyny as well as you do in that documentary. 
And I wonder if based on that, you could rewind a bit and maybe speak in some detail. Um, because I said to you, uh, we communicated via the comments on, on, uh, on your documentary on YouTube. Um, I said something to you like, uh, you know what? I, I know my Kent Hoven stuff, but as Peter was saying earlier, you filled in so many little details that I didn't know. It was really quite fascinating. And one of the things that I didn't know in the way that you lay it out is who Tom Malone is or was and how Tom Malone um, became the person, and you, you said it a moment ago, Tom Malone really did become the person that Kent modeled his ministry on. Uh, and you say, as an introduction to the Tom Malone segment in the first hour of the documentary, you say that th there are these two characteristics of people who attended the Midwestern Baptist College, where Tom Malone was the founder and chief pastor you say that there are two things that define these people their narcissism and their misogyny can you talk more about tom malone in some detail and about what he gave to kent and what kent took from tom malone please yeah so i mean the the college is more about character building it's not really something they're, they're not really all that focused about education um, and with Tom alone, he, as I, the clip I put in there, he's talking about how a woman says like, you know, the, the, he's the head but of the house, but I'm the neck. I'll turn him any way I want. Uh, and Tom alone says, no, you won't not if he's a real man like that kind of embodies the misogyny, but to go further, the Bruce Gerentzer interview in the documentary version, um, is actually cut down quite a bit. Bruce is a truly amazing guy. Um, but he's a bit of that kind of long winded storyteller. So it's really hard to cut this down, you know, um, but there is an unlisted version of the interview. But in there, he talks about the, you know, the the course that what it was like for women at Midwestern. Um, and so when they're trying to educate these women about, you know, being a woman um, in a godly relationship and being a woman of the home, their education was a tea party because you have to learn mm -hmm. how to you know, do host a tea party. Um, and that is what they consider important for women, not education, not being leaders, not being uh, learning how to manage your finances, you know, uh, anything like that. It's how do you serve your husband? How do you host tea parties with other girls? Um, and how do you just essentially stay quiet and you do as your husband says? Um, and so a lot of so really just like a short answer. Tom alone is where Kent gets his misogynistic views against women. Henry Morris is where he gets his regurgitated, uh, you know, views on creation. Oh, I put both of those into Tom Malone. Um, yeah. But right, you make that distinction. I just forgot it. Yeah. Well, Tom Malone, he um, he is the one who essentially had, like instilled this hatred against atheists in Kent, because mm -hmm. um, in one of Tom Malone, uh, Tom Malone's sermons, "Can America Survive This?" Um, he's talking about how atheism is just a, a wicked, sinful, dirty heart and everything. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about evolution. Now, Tom Malone has no education as evolution, uh, but he mentions how evolution is taught in the schools and it's just essentially a way of insulting God. Um, so I think Tom Malone instilled the importance in Kent to have an argument against creationism. And so from there, he goes to Henry Morris to get that longer winded, longer, you know, study, essentially just copying what Tom Malone, uh, what, what Henry Morris said, but the core of Tom Malone, what Kent got from Tom Malone is misogyny and Henry yeah. Morris is where he got uh, creationist arguments. And do you make the point in the documentary um, that, that uh, the misogyny that he inherited from Tom Malone, which of course Tom Malone inherited from the Bible, um, that misogyny has fueled not only Kent's relationships with his intimate partners, but also, um, and I recall this vaguely, so so please refresh my, my memory on this, McKinnon. Um, you make the point that um, that misogyny that misogyny has played out also in terms of Kent's legal difficulties. Because he was prosecuted by a woman, et cetera. Can you talk a little? And I think that the judge was a woman. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I don't, like I mentioned in the documentary, I don't think his views on women started in a good place to begin with. Mm -hmm. But 
after all of these different women essentially destroyed his life, um, and rightfully so, it's not like they did it, you know, by lying, they rightfully showed you are screwing this up, you're doing this wrong. Um, it's just a list of women, you know, who essentially call, put him to task, you know? And so if you have a misogynistic mentality against women, and then that happens, just this list of women who essentially just go after you and like show, no, you aren't, you, know, you are, you are wrong. You got to think that that has to amplify it. And, you know, and it also affects the volunteers at Dinosaur Adventure Land who also experienced mm. kind of misogynistic mistreatment. That girl, that poor young woman yeah. who was a slave. Can you talk a little bit? I don't want to preempt the documentary. I'm trying to just pique people's interest in it. But <laughs> tell us a little bit about that poor young woman and what she was subjected to. There was two young women. Uh, it was Sierra Hammond, or ha Hammond and uh, Hannah Deborah. Sierra Hammond was essentially the cook. Um, and That's what I mean. The laundry. Uh, she was. She was the cleaning lady. Essentially, is what they made her. Um, and as they defined it, she did women's work. You know, that is work yeah. that she's going to do. Um, and they put the little caveat: Oh, well, the men can help you after they do all this hard day of labor, um, and that's up to them. Um, but yeah, essentially, they gave her a stove and like a shop sink. Um, one stove uh, and a very shoddy kitchen. I tried to find as many shots of the kitchen at that point <laughs> in time as I could. There was a clip of her in there, but you can see it's extremely poor. And if you have to feed anywhere from 25 to 50 people, three meals a day, um, and just, there was no dishwasher. She had to hand wash her every single dish. Um, that is a full time job. And then at the end of it, they're like, oh, also she can do your laundry. This one 18 year old child you know, is over there uh, handling all of this. And then Steve Lynn comes in there because one day she's like, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to spend time with my friend before he goes. Steve Lynn bursts into the girl's dorm room where they could have been naked, mm -hmm. undressed, anything. He yanks her into the kitchen, starts screaming at her, cursing at her and telling her that she better run this like an industrial kitchen and find somebody else who could. Um, that is pure massage. That is complete lack of respect. Um, and it's a, it's a horrible way to treat anybody. That is, that is, that is, um, of, there are two things. I mean, the whole, all of Kent makes me mad, but the two <laughs> things in the documentary that make me the angriest are his re reaction to when that eight year old boy drowned at dinosaur adventure land. And then the stories particularly of Sierra and that story of being dragged out of bed to to do the dishes that she left had planned to get up early to wash the next morning from the night before the, when she had to serve serve the men it's just but the 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 other girl that that was horrendous to watch too because as i said i follow kent hoven so i watched pretty much everything that came out and he had um this girl volunteer who was uh going through his email sorting out what what questions uh, should go to the, the, the live streams that he did. And he was basically uh, advertising her that she needed a husband. She was, uh, marry, and yeah. he needed to marry her off. And she repeatedly asked him not to do this. Not to. And he, then it stopped for a while and he started all over again. Uh, I later found out that she, she had a YouTube channel. She, uh, I think she plays the organ if I'm if I'm correct. So but she made a video about Kent Hovind explaining why she left. It is the the, mm. the treatment that the women get is is horrific. Yeah. They are viewed as second grade citizens. It, at least that's that's the idea that I got. I'm I'm not sure if you can I I know did you did you speak to Hannah too or was there an, an email ex exchange? No, those are two articles that they themselves wrote um, on their mm -hmm. own respective sites. Um, and so I was only able to take that. You hear my wife, my lovely wife, uh, narrating. <laughs> uh, the, 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 All right, the she does words. the voice, yeah. <laughs> so she she handled that. Uh, but yeah, they, they're very misogynistic. It's, it's actually... It's really important to point out, like with the Brady Byram call, who is also a very misogynistic individual mm -hmm. from the letter that he wrote to Cindy. Um, but Kent and Brady's courage, um, their, their, their willingness to be combative, 
pretty much halts the moment it's not a woman or a child. The moment it's actually a man is someone who doesn't uh, agree with them or doesn't like them. Suddenly, oh, I got to go. Oh, well, I'm not going to talk to you. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm going to Classic gonna bully. Exactly. So the moment yeah. that it's not a woman that they can overpower or a child that they can beat, their courage is gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's despicable. It, it is. It is. And, and um, yeah, as, as you said, Flynn, the, the, the way that it was, uh, he dealt with the child that drowned, that was just, I, I, I wanted to punch things when I watched his videos immediately after that. There's no McKinnon, maybe we should let McKinnon tell this story, eh? Yeah. No no empathy whatsoever. Mc, uh, go ahead, McKinnon. Uh yeah, so uh, a child uh drowned over at Dinosaur Adventure Land. Um R and Ra and I were talking in the interview uh, he and I did, and we both agreed that, you know, if if the child had drowned, you know, it's a lake, you know, we, we, my me and my kids, we go to a lake and there's there's no lifeguard. There's there's it's just a it's a it's a a muddy pond, you know, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and if a child drowns there, that is horrible. Um, and if Kent had responded like, oh, my God, a child died on my property, um, we need to have some safety measures put in place. We need to fix this. Mm -hmm. We may make sure this never happens again. Um, I, it, it, you couldn't. The reality is that it's not actually Kent's fault, you know, and I, I do want to make sure mm -hmm. that people are aware of that I do think he should have safety measures there. Sure. But it's that lake is no different than the lakes that me and my family swim in, swim in all the time, you know? Um, and so I don't really actually want to put blame on Kent for the child drowning. Um, but the reaction should be different. The reaction should be mm. feeling this remorse, this, this sense of duty that, Oh my God, I could do something though, to make sure this doesn't happen again, you know, and showing being there for the family and showing sympathy. Uh, and if he had done that, I actually would have an ounce of respect for Kent. You know, it would be a moment that like, oh, you do have a heart. There, there's something there. You have problems, but there's a person there, you know, mm. um, not with Kent. With Kent, it's the child did something stupid. Yeah. Um, yeah kids do stupid things sometimes. That's what you said. Sometimes stupid kids do stupid things. He said yeah. about the eight-year-old boy who drowned and it was only three feet of water and he drowned. Yeah. He can't say he can't well, say drown. The, the, the problem that I have with this, and, and you said it, it's no other than, than the lake that I go to with, with my kids. I think it is. This is a park that is, that is aimed at children. Dinosaur Adventureland is a park aimed at children to, to have uh, children follow his, his kind of Bible lessons. If that is your intent, then there should have been a lifeguard all the time. The moment there are children present on on your property, and there are uh, yeah. there should be there could be a risk. I mean, this was a seven year old boy. There there are younger children there. If if they're left unattended on that property, it's not just the lakes. There are there are uh rocks that they can climb on and fall off there there's so many hazards there you need to have supervision for those kids all over the park where they are don't let them uh go off on their own that is your responsibility i don't think you can brush that off with with uh, uh there are other lakes yes there are but this is something special this is your property you want to have children there so you it's your task to make sure that they're safe and that is i i i can't help but thinking about it i i went i i used to help out with the children's camp uh where were children from parents that uh were less fortunate or parents that were in prison or other things where, where there were problems in the home for well, one euro they got the chance to uh, to go to a, a farm where we usually had uh, a, a farm converted into a youth home where they had beds and, and stuff already. For one euro, they spent an entire week and, and we did all kinds of activities with them. We took them out for, for uh, uh, 
all kinds of activities. At no time, those kids were left alone. At no time, there were was a, a situation where there wasn't any supervision. And that's the part that I don't get. That is what what makes me so mad about Dinosaur Adventureland. They're not; e they don't even have insurance. They've got a waiver. Uh, people I sign. Ask that they have waivers. Yeah, and... they have a waiver that uh, they're not responsible for anything that happens while they are there. And I find that horrific. It's. Yeah, you make a good point. You know, it's, it's not just built for kill for for children. You know, I mean, that absolutely should have the parameters put in place. So, yeah, you actually, yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And he says, Hoven says in a video, um, in your documentary, that this video clip comes before the video clip where he says, stupid kids do stupid th things, and he drowned it. Um, <clears throat> He says that, uh, you know, yeah, it's true. Uh, this uh, young child, uh, s seven years old, he uh, he drowned in uh, in our uh, in our swimming hole or whatever he called it. And he said, now, the water is only three feet high. So I actually Googled what is the average height of a seven year old boy. And at three feet deep, water would have if he's of average height at that age, water would have been would have covered his mouth if he were standing in, in that water. Right. So yeah. I do, I agree with Peter that um, it's not quite the same as your lake. I don't think McKinnon, I, I grew up around water, uh, <laughs> a river right down the street from me. And there's one down the street from me where I am now. Um, that's, and you know, you take, you take your chances if you go into that water, but when you're inviting people onto your property, you are assuming <laughs> some degree of liability. And I didn't know, but I'm not surprised to learn, Peter, or maybe I forgot, not, not surprised to know that uh, Hoven didn't have any insurance for this. No. Because who would insure him? <laughs> yeah. No, no one would. No one would. And so, and this is where I don't get it that that authorities don't have anything in place that if you open a park like that that you're it's mandatory for you to have insurance it, it it's to, to me it's mind-boggling and and i say that in uh so the netherlands uh, doesn't have states it has provinces in my province there's a dinosaur adventure park and and it's it's a much nicer looking than the one Kent Hovind has, and it has actual actual science the kids learn there, but that is also aimed at kids, and they have uh, people all over the place whenever there's there's a thing where where kids could get hurt. So yeah. that. That America is that um, far behind that that's not mandatory and that you don't have to have insurance. It it to me that is mind boggling. Uh, but I do want to get to uh, a couple a of deregulation movement. Yeah, so. I do want to get to a couple of questions from the chat before they disappear. I usually have a tool where I can pull them up, but uh, before this show went live, I I changed the the setup and I forgot to import. Uh, the necessary tool to bring up the the things on screen so i'll, I'll read them out from uh, algorithm he says i'd be curious to know what mckinnon thinks uh, is next for kent fade to obscurity a raid on his cult long prison term or what oh I, kent has very much demonstrated that there's no telling um <laughs> there, <laughs> there's it can go in so many different ways uh yeah. but at the same time <laughs> I, as I mentioned, I, I'm not watching any more videos, not looking at any more links. Someone sends me yeah. something about Kent. I'm good. Uh, so I won't even know what happens next. Uh, but I genuinely, I could not know. It could be another, another abuse of his wife. Um, yeah. There could be details, you know, brought out about, you know, how he operates the ministry. Uh, Steve mm -hmm. Lynn could kill somebody. There's no telling what's going to happen. You know, Powell mm -hmm. could kill somebody. That well, yeah, I don't. Uh, he's <laughs> kind of spineless too. The, the thing yeah. about you know uh, killing somebody, I mean, 
even though it's not a good, I'm not trying to put spineless in this in, in this way as a positive, but I don't even think he has that level of gumption and conviction to actually mm. go through with it. I mean, he's he's anyway, next question. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> next next question comes from uh, an atheist snail's journey. Uh, he says he or she says, um, we know Hoven physically abused his son. Do we know anything about his daughter? Uh, not me personally. There is a story um, of Kent Hoven or Kent Andrew Hoven Jr. Um, about how, mm -hmm. again, details are scarce. That's why it's not in the documentary. I couldn't validate anything. Um, but that Kent is responsible for his condition. Um, but again, mm -hmm. I can't verify anything. Um, so beyond uh, him voluntarily uh, you know, admitting to abusing his children uh, and Cindy Lincoln and Mary Toko's testimony about abusing a 13 year old boy um, or, you know, slamming him down to the ground as well. Mm. That's the extent of the knowledge that I know. Um, and then also Joe Hovind avoiding the question of whether or not uh, abused her. that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I I have to say I I have heard the accusation about uh, uh, Kent Andrew. If that's true, that's that's even more horrific than than the things that happened to uh, hmm. uh, to Eric. I I also I also only heard it as a, as you say. There's it's n there's not a way to verify it, although. Uh, I think the family back then urged him uh, to take action, but then what you would need is someone from the family coming forward and speaking out about it, and I I don't think that that has happened. Did you get to talk to any of the the other family members, uh, a brother? I think you had a, a a nephew in the in the documentary. Is that Chad Hoven's quote, um, Kent's nephew? Um, was a also just an article I've spoken uh, for for years now with Joe Hoven. She actually sends me Christmas presents. I have a better relationship with his first wife than he does. Um, mm. But she and I have actually spoken quite a bit. Um, and but from now for pretty much now on, we're not talking about Kent. She just wants to put this behind her. Mm -hmm. um, so she she was not going to you know discuss that. I I have something similar. I. Uh... A couple of years ago, we, uh, I had a friend who turned out to be uh, pretty abusive uh, towards women as well, and and grooming women with uh, uh, oh. with with problems. Uh, he wanted to set up his wife to uh, uh, his girlfriend to uh, have his new girlfriend move in, and then she would pay for all three of them which is uh, when, when I pretty much lost it. And so <laughs> I'm still talking to his now ex-girlfriend, and it's, it's similar. We don't talk about the guy anymore. It's, we have developed somewhat of a, re a friendly relationship, and we check up on each other every once in a while. And I think that's probably the best thing to do. You can't, you can't keep dwelling on something that they might just want to forget. That's a part of their life they're done with. And just raking things mm -hmm. up, I don't think that's that's a good thing to do either. I mean, uh, yeah. you don't know what people have been through. And and so it's best to uh, to let that, that lie. Uh, one last question from Dargendorp. Um, I'd be interested in what McKinnon's plans are for the documentary, let it live on you, let it live on YouTube. Let it live. Try, try to get it out into the real world. Also, some parts need subtitles. Yeah, um, there were a few parts that you know I, I could have put you know in the in late the subtitles in the video. I wanted to, um, and just you know to just dog on myself. I was lazy. I was really. Mm -hmm. I, I said I'm going to get this done by April 10th. Um, and I could have just taken one more hour to put the subtitles, but I didn't. Um, that said, if I am going to put it on Amazon Prime or Roku TV, which I do have the platform to do, um, oh. I am, I'm not going to do that until um, I get those subtitles on the, in the, in the, uh, the new rendering of the video. Um, but I am contemplating 
doing that. Um, but again, at this current moment, I am just in bliss of not <laughs> listening to Kent Hovind's voice anymore. Um, so I am just like, again, I, I am contemplating it. I can do it um, at pretty much at any point. And just, I don't want to go back into that video, yeah. but I, I probably will at some point. That's, that is a great answer. I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that you have a, uh, a pathway into a broader distribution because it really does deserve to be seen. And I've said this now a few times, the quality is top notch. Really, really is. It is. Thank you very um, much. I've actually, <laughs> I've contemplated, um, cause I, I have connections, uh, with, you know, Comcast and I can run TV commercials at any point. And I was thinking of just having those commercials air over in Repton, uh, in Lenox, Alabama for the documentary, just for a little oh, yeah. while. I'll just Targeted. put you know, $5,000 to it, let it run for three months, you know, until, <laughs> until that area has very much seen at least the commercial for the, yeah. for the, uh, the documentary. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, Peter, I'm, I, I'm Peter. Can I pull one more question from the chat, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dargendorp, I think it was asked, uh, does, uh, do you McKinnon think that Kent's side piece, Mad Powell has the chops to take over fr Kent's activities? And I assume that, uh, implicit in this question is that Eric is out of the, has been, you know, removed from the wheel sort of thing. Can, can Pat carry this forward? Is that the, the, the plan here? Uh, I think that's Kent's plan. I don't know what <laughs> Matt Powell's doing there. Um, and I, I think I even saw some text threads where he's like, I'm never moving to Dinosaur Adventureland, but there he is. So yeah, what the hell do I actually know? Um, so could be, I, I have no idea. Uh, I have, do you think video. he has, but I think the question McKinnon is, do you think that uh, Matt has the chops to do it? Oh, I mean, yeah, he just regurgitates what Kent says already. All he's going to do is just <laughs> of. I mean, and he, and he speaks to his volunteers like horribly. If you've seen that one clip of him yelling at some yep. guy in his church, like, yeah, it fits like a glove. Yeah. yeah. Which which brings us to uh, a tiny commercial that I would want to play, and then maybe we can talk a bit, little bit about that. So uh, here goes. The title of my message today is True Love Through Marriage. But I've seen a lot of people that really struggle in this area of true love. Do people look happy to you? They don't seem very happy. I'm just so insecure because he won't marry me. These effeminate little sissies. What a whip! Hey man, man up! Get up! Bunch of atheist losers. That's going to make them feel insecure. Right. So, more is coming. More is coming. And I couldn't be more delighted that more is coming because I hope, really hope that there is going to be more even after this one. But, so, um, do you want to, to disclose anything about the, the new and upcoming thing and and maybe your reasons why why you're taking on another person from the al yeah um i mean uh, the matt powell guy i'm not anywhere near interested in matt powell um kent hoven is horrible matt powell is horrible but kent's <laughs> interesting in like in a train wreck kind of way matt powell is just a shitty person so i mean he's not mm -hmm. there's nothing interesting there the reason I wanted to do it is because he does that. He has that sermon, um, which is the bulk of what you saw there. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talking about marriage, love, sex, pornography. Um, and so I was driving while I was listening to that sermon. And I just about wrecked my truck because I was laughing so hard throughout the whole thing. Um, and so I, I sat there and thought we could do a really kind of fun video with this because I, I love that everybody like, or not everybody but the vast majority have liked the documentary it's very rewarding um but that type of content is not what i want to do like the vast majority of the time i want content that's mm -hmm. fun that's comedic mm -hmm. um you know that and uh, also touches on some personal topics you know and so this one is finally being able to go in that direction the trailer kind of very much shows that very upbeat and you know 
Um, but that video is going to just basically be a response to that sermon. Uh, but it's going to, it's done in a pretty high production film kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend, Brad, uh, Brad Holly, who you saw on the credits. Um, he, um, he's going to be kind of like my handler calling me into service. Like we need you to you know, take care of this. Uh, mm -hmm. there's a straight up fight scene in this, in this project <laughs> coming up. Uh, and so I have a, a good friend of mine who, you know, we went to high school together and he's really good at filming. Um, but he's, he's going to be doing the fight scenes. It's going to be like a one shot. There's a whole production behind this, you know? Um, but it's, it's going to be quite fun. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to get that one going. I, I yeah, can't, I people can tell. I, I can't wait. I think people can tell if they haven't. Yeah. I can't wait either, Peter. I think people can tell from the production value of just that teaser. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary, the production value is as high for two hours, basically. It's really <laughs> well done. Yeah. Um, it reminded me a bit of uh, of the 9-11 conspiracy film Loose Change. Uh, not in that it had was conspiracy theorist oriented, <laughs> but in the slickness. Uh, and I don't mean slickness in a bad way now, not in a matte slick way, at least. Um, there is, it is... It's just so, it's so, so well done. <laughs> but I have a question for you. Oh, um, <laughs> first, I would just say that um, seeing, see, hear, seeing and hearing Matt Powell talk about uh, effeminate men or whatever he said as he's mincing around the platform by his lectern, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll take masculinity, masculinity lessons from him when I take them from Tucker Carlson, basically. But... <laughs> McKinnon, you said that uh, Ted is at least interesting. Um, Matt Powell is, I think you just said, just a shitty person or something like that. Yeah. So that suggests that Kent has some redeeming personality traits or characteristics. Um, do you have a, ideas about what those may be? I wouldn't say it's redeeming. It's just he's <laughs> he's useful in the fact that his life that he's lived, like I said, like at the beginning of the documentary, he starts from a small town in Illinois, or at least it was small back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, you know, but he's interesting because of just the path and everything that happened and the, you know, the whole IRS thing and going to prison for nine years. Like yeah. he's interesting, like I put in the documentary, he's interesting the same way Charles Manson is. Charles Manson yeah. doesn't have representative qualities, but he's interesting in a negative way. You know, Matt Powell, like I said, he doesn't have that. He's just this very ironically effeminate scrawny little twink yeah uh, and there's and nothing I'm wrong just... with being effeminate that's fine but yeah no it's not that but when you are saying like men should be then. this like and you're trying to say like a man up with the highest pitch voice from a man that i've ever seen and then you're trying to act like it's bad to be effeminate as you def as you embody everything yeah. you're criticizing that is where i'm like this is a problem here yeah by the way, something you just said makes me realize that something that Kent says a lot, not in the CSE courses so much, but he said it in a lot of the the uh, the talks that he's given in churches. He says, uh, you know, he basically does the First Peter three fifteen thing. You need to go. You need to be winning souls for Christ. And uh, if you're not winning souls for Christ, um, if you can't do that, then the then at least you can set a bad example. And Kent is that bad example, right? Because what you just described is what's commonly known as a Horatio, Al Horatio Alger story, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and fighting the headwinds and succeeding under your own sort of determination and fortitude. Except that Kent, and he did, he pulled himself up from his bootstraps, but his, his vision and his personality, I think, became so corrupted that he's really only at his best as a bad example. So he's self prophetic in a way or a self fulfilling prophecy of himself. <laughs> consider, Peter, consider, Peter? Considering that, that, that you're going to do Matt Powell. Uh, I, I have fun memories of Matt Powell because he was on our show and I, I remember. So when, when we do our show and, and, we did that with you. Uh, we send out the link uh, for the guest about fifteen minutes early. Uh, if if I'm if I'm early, it might be twenty minutes. I think it with with Matt, it was earlier. 
And we did have a conversation, and I I always think that that helps. Uh, uh, if you want to have a decent conversation, not bring someone in cold, but just have a little chat before you go live, and that all of that went well. And the moment I said I'm going to start the stream, right before I started the intro, Matt asked a question. Oh, I forgot to ask. You guys aren't homos, are you? Oh, Completely yeah. out of the blue. No reason for that. And I thought, okay, if, if this is what you are like, I'm going to have a question at some point during. And he gave me that chance uh, when he brought up uh, the KGV Bible. And I told him, hey, did you have any, do you know what, what King James was about? I mean, he was famously the guy who was the first outspoken royal in Europe uh, coming out as bisexual, he had several boyfriends in his in his main castle. He had a, a door in his bedroom to the bedroom of his boyfriend, and he literally used uh, Jesus as an example in in British government mm. to uh, explain. Well, uh, Jesus could be gay, so why can I? Can't I? I mean. And that's where he rage quit. So my, my idea is that he's somewhere deep in the closet. He's so far in the closet he can oh, see Narnia. Oh, he's projecting total projection. Total but projection. Uh, I'm I'm going to enjoy whatever is going to come out. I, I take it. Have Have you uh, seen Matt Powell's channel? By the way, if you go if you go yeah. all the way down, there's some very strange videos. Uh, there's a Mountain Dew video. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, the Mountain Dew commercial is actually going to, I think, have a part. In <laughs> um, seems like he oh, was just trying to well, He's actually kind of going back to his roots with his latest videos. Um, but yes. the, uh, yeah, that, that, that's going to be, you know, uh, the, in there. And I still don't get it. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's a language barrier because I'm Dutch. But I, I still don't know what oh. the intent behind the Mountain Dew thing was. I, I still have no clue. And then he has the bloopers, which I haven't seen anyone use on YouTube. And they're they're pretty much comedy gold. That you could use those in in videos as well. And no one has as so far. I actually, um, yeah, the, he, he definitely is, uh, he's just, he's comedy gold because he's just like, <laughs> such a tool, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but like with Kent, once the Matt Powell thing is done, moving on, got other projects yeah. I want to do. Uh, but yeah, I'll never watch another Matt Powell video after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never, I've never thought to even look at Matt Powell's channel, but I just opened a tab. So thanks a lot, guys, for being <laughs> in my fucking life now. Just um, just so maybe, scroll uh, scroll down scroll down to know, saw, to the I very saw, beginning. Four years ago, the Mountain Dew. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, there I are... think that's probably clout chasing in a way, right? Trying to attract people to his channel by having Mountain Dew in the title. Maybe I don't know. I haven't seen the video. Um, so McKinnon. Um, you said, you know, once you, you're, you're very, I, I was impressed with what you said a little while ago, but how you, you were bound and determined you're going to be finished the, I think the Hoven doc by April 10th, and you could have spent another hour, but you said, no, that's it. I'm moving on. That is, wow. That's some discipline. And now you've said, Matt Powell, I'm going to do it. And then I'm moving on. I, again, uh, I believe you have <laughs> the track record. What do you see in the long term? Not just in terms of maybe topics, although I'd be interested to hear. And I do subscribe to you on Patreon, and I know you don't like to ask people to do it, but I'm asking people to check out McKinnon's Patreon because he does the work. <laughs> and, you know, it'd be nice to, for us to support him as a community. Um, but McKinnon, as much as you can, uh, future subjects. I want to add on to that, uh, or, Professor Flynn. Which is Just the trajectory of your career. I, I want to just add on to what you said about Patreon, because the links to McKinnon are in the description of the video. He told me not to put in the Patreon link. 
So maybe we should tell people to go find his Patreon account and, and still donate some money to the man that made this incredible work and is modest enough to say, okay, put everything in there, but no need to put in the Patreon link. That says something I about... I had to beg him. That, I almost had to beg him to give me the Patreon. <laughs> I mean, I, that my thing is this: like, I, I, I am. I don't want to like sound big headed with this, but I was very wise with my mind. I'm only 28 years old. I mm. do not have to work. I work with this company right now because I believe in them and I like the guys that I work with. Um, I'm good. You know, the Patreon is because everyone kept for a little while there. It's ironic. A lot of them actually never showed up, but there was a lot of people like, "Where's your Patreon? Give me a Patreon. Give me a Patreon." I was like, "Well, I wasn't going to create one." You know, but I, I'll go ahead and do it, I guess. Um, and so I, I'm not really encouraging anyone to do it. I'm fine. Like I can, I can make it work. Um, I, this is all just my personal projects. But I, I mentioned in one of the comments, like if you are just so compelled, there's a link. If you guys want to put the link in this video, okay. But you do not have to. We buy you some coffee. Think of it that way, right? <laughs> okay. It's more of a, it's more of a gesture of thanks than a, than a, you know grassroots funding mechanism maybe oh well, buy me a dr pepper i actually don't drink coffee <laughs> ah neither do i i've never had a drink of coffee in my life yeah that and i don't drink alcohol and i just got back from a company trip i'm pretty sunburned right now um yeah. and they all got hammered i don't drink alcohol so like i was kind of like, alcohol either he said i was the designated drink. driver of the whole situation <laughs> good for you you're on mute man i see peter's lips moving but yeah i i was out. i was on mute uh so i i think it's really commendable but i uh yeah as you said and and i'm going against my own my own religion because i don't even have a patreon and <laughs> and yep. i've i've had people wanting to donate i literally got an email uh that someone was paying me in paypal and i don't have a paypal account so uh. It is. I literally only follow. I, I'm only. I a blocked Patreon everything. Two people. They're both Hoven people. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's McKinnon and AJ Atheist Junior. They're the only. There are lots of people I could, and you know, I make a good living. Not a problem. But you know, you can't. You just can't give to every you know noble yeah. cause. Um, but uh, and I didn't intend only to support Hoven related <laughs> Patreons. But I'm okay with it too. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> but so um, now the 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 Matt Powell thing is going to be different. Are there any other things that that you're going to be working yeah. on pe uh, that people can see on your channel? And in, in in what direction are you are you thinking of of moving after all this? Uh, so right now I have a list of projects um, about thirty projects long. Um, and the, the reason it's so long is because I was poisoned with a perfectionist mentality. Um, and I've actually created content for a, quite a few years now. And I deleted them all before I ever posted them because I was like, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Yeah. Um, and I, the, ironically, everyone keeps saying the editing on these things are so good. I fucking hate editing. I, I hate it. It's the bane of my damn existence. Um, so the fact that everyone's loving the, the, that so much, but the projects that I have after the Matt Powell thing, I think the next video I'm going to be doing is kind of going back to the type of content, like my video life after God, um, where I'm talking about things that like I struggle with or things that I, I want to see improvements on. So the next video after Matt Powell is going to be about death, um, and kind of just coming to grips on how you can, how I am trying to get over the fact that I'm going to die. Um, you know, so that's something that I personally think about quite often. That's why I'm motivated to do everything I do. Um, but that's something that I, it's a really interesting topic. A lot of it, I think I want to have some pretty, you know, uh, really good visual shots and everything, but it's going to be mainly me talking. But then there's a bunch of other ones. I think on my 30th birthday, I'm going to do one called Waste of Oxygen, which is because that's what my father called me like pretty much a lot of throughout my life. Um, and it's going to be just from, you know, birth to where I'm at now. Um, and, uh, I, I'm not doing another documentary for another two years. Um, I'm starting the research and development phase now for the purity fallacy, um, which is about, you know, the, the 
Christianity, especially here in America, their influence on, you know, purity culture and abstinence only thinking and mm -hmm. um, just the negative influences it's had on, you know, sexual health and sexual education um, and relationships and marriage. Uh, so I'm in the two year development phase of that right now. Um, but there's a bunch of, I have a, I have a mockumentary coming out actually pretty soon. It's not a long one. It's just a mockumentary about how Taco Bell canceled the volcano burrito. Um, <laughs> and absolutely a sin. I went to Taco Bell how dare they? I just want to test. I just wanted to test it. And I'm like, is there anything you could even like slightly, you know, just shoehorn away, like take some ingredients and make the volcano burrito for me again. And this child at the, at the drive through was like, what's the volcano burrito. And oh, I was like, no. Yep. All right. So we're doing a documentary, <laughs> but it's a, it's a comedic, you know, funny thing. It's not supposed to be serious. Um, but yeah, I'm doing those kind of videos, but I, I really want to focus more on things about improving myself and hopefully by me exploring myself, it can maybe be useful for other people who are kind of struggling to the same thing. Um, so those I'm are the really person. Really Holy crap. Huh? That is, ex that is, I mean, you're a bright guy. That's obvious. That's an exceptionally thoughtful thing to say. Oh, well, thank that, you very much. That's just so impressive. Um, I wonder, Peter, uh, if you don't mind, and McKinnon, if you don't mind, this the Herding Cats uh, show is about atheists talking about their atheism to some extent. So, uh, Peter, if it's okay with you, and McKinnon, if it's okay with you, do you want to tell us a little? I know you're in like not the most enlightened part of Texas. Do you want to <laughs> tell us a little about your? journey into atheism or your experience being an atheist or can you fill in some of those blanks yeah uh if you want the longer story you can watch uh, my video life after god uh because that yeah. pretty much covers the whole thing um but I, I was brought up in a very very religious area i grew up in a town called bonham texas horrible place um but i grew up there and it was very like you know biscuits and gravy jesus you know a god family country football are like that's your the list of your priorities in that yeah. order you know and don't let anybody know you actually watch gay porn you know so, so there's a whole lot of you know that kind of community that's out there that i grew up in um and at one point uh, i just I don't know. I saw Joshua Fierce sign and I used to like that guy. Oh, oh uh, yeah. yeah. It's always embarrassing to, to look always back so in my bad. life. And like, I used to think that guy was cool, you know. Yeah. Um, wow. But uh, I, I went into the comment section of one of his, his videos and it was just nothing but atheists. It was just, and I, yeah. I come from a very small town. I had never seen so many. I, I don't even think I actually met an atheist that I what, what knew was an atheist anyway. Um, hmm. And so from there, I thought it was incumbent upon me being a Christian. I should, you know, talk with the atheist, try to get him. Converted. Sorry, how old are you at this point? Oh, shit. Uh, 20. OK, so in adulthood. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I Sorry. start, you know, talking with him and everything. And uh, I the whole time I'm actually not I struggled with belief like I did believe but there was things that, you know, they, they talked about, I just couldn't actually yep. deep to my core get behind like things that just clearly didn't make sense. So I knew when I was reading their comments, like, Hey, they don't care about Bible verses. They don't care about preaching. They want evidence. And I actually did too. And so I would just talk very earnestly with them, you know, going back and forth, like, Hey, I'm not trying to like be a jerk. I'm not trying to act like I'm better than you. Um, I believe in God. I would actually like for you guys to believe in God too. What would that take? You know, um, and taking that very earnest approach, um, you can find a lot of atheists who act like dickheads. Um, and I, I talk, I talked about that in the video as well. Uh, but Guilty. they were really, they were really, you know, you know, pretty uh, positive and confident with me, you know? And so we just went back and forth. I'm like, does this work as evidence? What about this? And at one point I was even talking about jellyfish with them because i was like an example of an animal without a brain and somehow we could make a life without a brain and that how that's how we could correlate to god being a being without a brain mm. i was just i was doing whatever i could i was like is this yeah. work, Does this work? Yeah. Yeah. and if they told me no it's like i i couldn't be angry because i knew they were right you know i was like no yeah you're right shit that doesn't work um mm. and you can only do that so much before your belief just starts yeah. to you know erode yeah. you know and so for a while i was a deist and then I was talking with a friend uh, from high school and uh, I, at one point in the conversation, I forget how it gets steered this way, but uh, at some point I said, yeah, I don't believe in God uh, anymore either. 
Um, and I just said it naturally. Like I wasn't even thinking, I just said it and I was like, oh, shit. I just said that. And like, and I, and I knew it was true. I was like, I, I actually, I don't believe in God anymore. Uh, and I haven't since. That's very interesting <laughs> because my, and I won't tell the story cause I've told it before, but my, I, my, I became an atheist, although, you know, I didn't know any atheists and I don't think I would have known that atheism was a word, but <laughs> I became an atheist when I was eight or nine years old, sitting in Sunday mass and looking at the statuary during the homily, the sermon, <clears throat> and in this beautiful cathedral that we went to every Sunday and sometimes two or three times a week. And I'd been learning about the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. And as the sermon's going on, I'm looking around, I'm like, you know what? I'm just thinking to myself, we don't believe the whole Apollo flying his magic fiery chair across the sky being the sun rising and setting. How much longer are we going to believe this baloney? And I remember vividly having that thought. I, uh, I recently found a video about my church and I could actually locate in the video the exact place I was sitting in the church when I was eight or nine years old when I had this sort of revelation, but I never talked about it. So my, I had, I had what I guess you would call a true epiphany. It was like, boom, light bulb. You um, certainly came to the moment where you said you just said it. You didn't plan to say it, but you just said it. I don't believe but your experience seemed to have been, which I don't recall mine being, yours seemed to be you, you were laying planks and laying planks and laying planks and laying planks and laying planks. And, and then you realized, holy shit, I've built a house. I might as well proclaim ownership over it. Fair? Yeah, actually. It, yeah, it's an amazing way to put it. And I kind of wish I had said something like that in the video. Life <laughs> after God. So thanks for that. Well, that, compor <laughs> that comports that comports with what I what, what I said about you a few minutes ago, which is your and I hope this is coming across to people. You're very thoughtful. You're almost methodical in your thoughtfulness. And that's a compliment. Um, <laughs> always nice to meet a thoughtful person. Um, so thanks. Well, <laughs> well, well, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Peter? I want to add on, on one thing. Uh, you mentioned uh, Josh Feuerstein, oh. whose, whose, name, whose name is actually Feuerstein. This is German. Feuerstein? Feuerstein. He's a young earth creationist. He believes that dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. Funny enough, I grew up in the Netherlands, and most of the uh, the cartoons, what, what I remember from when I was young, which was a long time, which was before the flood, um, but uh, what, what I remember is that on Dutch TV, we didn't have a lot of cartoons. We didn't have uh, Laurel and Hardy and, and all the, the slapsticks movies. Those were all on German TV, which is why I speak German, because I used to watch that. Uh, and one of the things was the Flintstones. We had the Flintstones in the Netherlands, which was just called the Flintstones. In Germany, everything is translated and uh, the sound is dubbed. So in Germany, uh, Flintstone is is uh, what what you use in in a lighter to get the spark. In Germany, that is oh yeah 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 that is called yeah. a Flintstone is called a Feuerstein. So Fred Flintstone <laughs> in Germany oh. was Fred Feuerstein or Feuerstein, however you want to pronounce it. He's Brett Flintstone. <laughs> so every single time that name comes up. To me, in my brain, I see Fred Flintstone and I see Young Earth Creationist and th th it just all comes together. He's the one guy who has the perfect name for that position. Although you know I, what we need, what we desperately need from, from I was going to say from some of the, the photo edit, the video editing geniuses around you, but I'm speaking to one, Peter. Mm -hmm. Find some of the footage of Kent driving around Dinosaur Adventureland in his little golf cart thing and and find a way to edit in the Fred Flintstone feet, like actually propelling, <laughs> you know, sticking through the floorboards and propelling it. Because Kent's whole ministry is based on the Flintstones, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I did at some point start. Uh, uh, I, Except I, he lets Wilma. I had a picture. I had a picture of two kids on. Uh, uh, a toy motorcycle with a sidecar and i i did start out the one was was uh, it was a superman uh motorbike i think and both were dressed up 
and I had Kent as the driver and Matt Powell in the sidecar. I I never finished it before. I, I had something else to do back then. <laughs> I I should still finish that. And I do have a picture. I do have a picture of Arn Ra on. I think it was a toy horse, a rocking horse. So maybe I'll I'll add in the two and just pester Arn with it. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm, I don't. I don't know. Right, just to bother him. But we've we've come up to to an hour and a half, and it's it's gone by faster than uh, than I, I would want it to. Are there any links? I know you don't want to stay. It's late for you, Peter. Are, mm -hmm. I just thought I would ask: Are there any lingering questions from the live chat? Uh, I haven't seen any any other questions. I asked people to to no, tag me in. Mocking me. Uh, Beach Price said, uh, I'd like to see McKinnon go after some of the famous Nigerian pastors. Oh, mm. <laughs> that's, uh, that's have a tough, whole though. At, uh, that's well, tough to do because no matter how you do it, you will be, you will be, um, in, in all, as a racist. In all honesty, you could make a mockumentary about that because I have seen pastors who let their flock eat grass. It's, I'm not even kidding. It's, it's horrific. The things that, that go on over there, but, uh, McKinnon, anything, uh, we didn't touch on and you want to, to have out. Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. Um, you know, as long as everybody had their questions answered, um, is I'm think I've, I've covered everything. Like I said, I'm trying to put this Ken Hoven phase behind, behind you. <laughs> Well, okay, but then well, well, there we'll is still on again on a different topic. <laughs> you still have a channel, so still people need to go over and subscribe. As I said, I put all the links down below in the uh, in the description, so people know where to find you on Twitter uh, and and your channel and Facebook. So um, I want to thank you for uh, accepting our invite to come and and have a chat here. Uh, I was kind of jealous of JL Warren, who beat me to it, but uh, JL, <laughs> JL's a good guy, so um, I, yeah, I can't well, be... You had the better audio, because like, mine is muffled on that one. He didn't say anything. I was like, JL, what are you doing, man? Like, I saw the <laughs> video afterwards. I was like, oh! Like, I, I had to go and get this mic specifically for this reason. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot for, for hopping on and, and talking uh, so about, about your work. And again, for people who haven't seen it, it I think it's the yeah. best documentary I've ever seen. Uh, oh, the, the editing work, the research, everything, it's the complete it package. It's, it's exceptional. It is a work of art. And I want to thank you for putting in all that work. I know how much work goes into editing a video, mm -hmm. so I can really appreciate it when people put in the time and make sure that it is it is perfect. You might not think it is perfect. I think it is. The the whole thing, the way it's done, it's, it, it's beautiful. And if people want to learn how to make a documentary, go over and watch. That's how you do that. So, uh, again... <laughs> it took him thanks. two years, though. Yeah. Well, and, and you can see that. Everything... So, yes, you can. I was taught everything that is worth doing is worth doing well and i'm i'm kind of a perfectionist myself uh not sure if i'm uh that to the point uh where, where, where you're at mckinnon but um i i absolutely loved it and i hope that there's there's more to come because i'd love to see more work done in that particular way it's it yeah it's it's worth watching Watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Okay, Thank you very so much. The next documentary is in two years. <laughs> okay, well, so Thanks, then McKinnon. we'll we'll close it up, uh, Professor Flynn. Thanks for uh, being here, and uh, I've done my worst. There, there are yeah, you know, well, there are other things to come. Uh, we are still waiting for our guest who who wasn't able to stay on the show for longer than 10 minutes at the time so he might be back and then we've got we've got a few other guests we've got a few muslims coming on so I hope we hear from him i hope we hear from preacher x again yes me too but preferably before he's going to do his four day straight 
sermon going through the Bible from back. He might not survive that, but we'll see. Okay, I want to thank everyone in the side chat, and we'll catch you all in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Love you guys. Thank you.